Hello, KubeCon. There we go. How's everybody doing this afternoon? Energy, energy, passion. <laughs> All right. So I'm Alan Stewart. I'm a principal software architect at uh, Microsoft in uh, Azure Engineering, a little small company, doing a few things with cloud. And I'm here to introduce our STEAM panel, talking about improving and managing Kubernetes at scale. I know that's not a topic anybody's concerned with here, right? Because Kubernetes just magically scales itself. No? Okay. So why don't we get started? So first, we have Amit, who's a senior software architect at Uber. Okay. June, who's a staff software architect at Pinterest. Zhang, who's a senior software staff engineer at Alibaba. Harry, who's our esteemed moderator for the session, who's a software engineer at Pinterest. So I'll get out of the way and turn you over to our colleagues. Give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Forgot me. Oh, sorry. I missed somebody. <laughs> and we have Corin, who's a senior software architect at the Netflix and Chill Company. Thank you. All right, welcome to the panel. What a conference, it's been two, almost two days and it's been great, a lot of talks and chats and um, panels as well. So welcome to today's panel uh, to talk about Kubernetes in production in different companies. And today we are very honored to have invited four people from four different companies and all of them are serving their users, their customers from all over the world. Um, there are Alibaba, uh, Netflix, and Pinterest, and Uber. Um, so before we actually start our panel, I'd like to do a small poll. The first poll is about um, Kubernetes serving. How many of you guys run Kubernetes on public cloud and manage them yourself? Please raise your hand. Wow, a lot of them. Uh, on public cloud, but using managed services like EKS or AKS or GKE? Plenty. Okay, uh, how many of you guys run Kubernetes on on-prem data center? More than that. Okay, um, so the second small poll is about the Kubernetes adoptions. How many of you guys started your uh, businesses on Kubernetes from day one? Okay, so it sounds like most of the people will go to the second category, that, like how many of you guys have been going through or is going through or will be going through service migrations from existing infrastructure to Kubernetes. Awesome. So hopefully like uh, for the companies here, we are sharing a lot of stories with, uh, with people and we're gonna take questions and hopefully this session is going to be informative and helpful. Um, so let's start with people introducing uh, themselves. I'm gonna have all the panelists give a brief heads up about uh, who they are, the team they work for, and the current status of Kubernetes um, in each companies. Uh, let's start with, how about Netflix? Sure, this is a great crowd, more than I expected. <laughs> um, so I'm Corin Dwyer. I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix and I work on the compute platform team. Um, so I primarily work on the control plane and scheduler for Titus, Netflix's open source multi-tenant container management platform. And Titus um, enables a variety of workloads at our company, ranging from machine learning jobs to stream processing to the video encoders, as well as critical web services that power the Netflix product. Uh, and these workloads, they run on thousands of machines or hundreds of thousands of CPUs across three Amazon regions. So historically, Titus did not use Kubernetes. It was built on Mesos as a Uber framework, and it used Mesos as a way to manage machines, basically handle the machine registration, as well as a mechanism to send requests to create and terminate containers. And earlier this year, we decided, what if we were able to replace that Mesos resource provider with something like Kubernetes? So we hooked this up to Kubernetes API server using pods and nodes, 
and some CRDs, and we were able to get similar functionality. Uh, and we're currently in the process of migrating our current Mesos-backed clusters to Kubernetes, and that's where we're currently at. Hi, I'm Xiang from uh, Alibaba, uh, technically Alibaba Cloud. So our team uh, is a cloud native team at Alibaba. So our team does two things. So one is to manage the internal uh, infrastructures for the uh, Alibaba e-commerce. So the e-commerce is a very large uh, business uh, in China, and we have uh, very unique uh, use cases for the uh, cloud management system. And our team also serve the um, uh, uh, Kubernetes service is called ACK. It's very similar to uh, EKIs or GKE. Uh, the service is on Alibaba Cloud, so our team does two things. And uh, we adopt uh, Kubernetes, I think, uh, uh, late uh, earlier in uh, last year. Uh, before that, historically, we had our in-house build a cluster management system, and we moved to uh, Kubernetes for a few reasons. So first, we believe in open source, especially open source in the uh, uh, infrastructure space. Second, Kubernetes and cloud native has a very strong community, and we want to absorb all the innovations into Alibaba infrastructure. Third, we want to serve our customers with the same technologies that we use inside the Alibaba group, and that's why we started our journey with uh, Kubernetes. And right now, we are running uh, Kubernetes clusters for our critical workload inside Alibaba group, and we run very large clusters. There are several thousand nodes, so when we have several um, these clusters, and we run tens of thousands of pods in those clusters. I think probably we and the uh, Ant Financial are running the uh, biggest Kubernetes cluster in the world. Uh, my name is June, and I work for the cloud platform team at Pinterest. Our team runs the cloud platform at Pinterest, which includes both uh, VMworld and uh, Kubernetes. The motivation for us to adopt Kubernetes is uh, first we want to relieve our engineers from the pain of knowing all the infrastructure details, have to manage their own runtime, and we just couldn't afford the luxury of every team needs to have an infrastructure engineer and SRE to do that. So it's a long time, long time pain for our engineers, and thanks for Kubernetes with both its extensibility and all kinds of features it has. Now our engineers are free from all these burdens, and uh, we also are uh, inspired by the operational easiness with Kubernetes. Uh, things like a cluster op operation cluster, uh, like a cluster uh, OS upgrading, has always been a pain for our SREs. But after we migrated to Kubernetes, we have done several countless rounds of uh, Kubernetes upgrade, uh, uh, OS upgrade, without if, without any interference with our applications. Our our users has no knowledge about all this operation at all, and uh, our infra uh, infra governance team really loves how easy to track the usage on the Kubernetes compute platform. And uh, third, uh, but not the least important, is we are really love the great community support with Kubernetes. With all, without the CRD expense, without the two level of autoscaler, without all this, all kinds of different features, our comp cloud platform will, won't be so, so successful. And uh, right now, uh, we are a productization cluster, and we, it's a uh, heterogeneous uh, cluster. We run all kinds of workloads, including machine um, batch jobs like machine learning or big data. We have uh, services, virus of different sizes from very small microservices to the huge fleets. And we also even have stateful services running our cluster and from all different kinds of teams, it's real multi-tenant heterogeneous uh, clusters. And uh, we really think that uh, we bet the we truly bet in the future of Kubernetes as our cloud strategy in the future. Uh, hello, my name is Amit Bose. Um, I work on the Uber Compute Infrastructure team. So we provide the cloud infrastructure for running Uber microservices as well as uh, bad jobs like for machine learning or for uh, big data. So. Um, as of today, Uber has a very mature infrastructure for supporting both microservices and uh, bad jobs that is based out of Mesos. 
and it, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a large scale system. Like to give you some idea, we have over 35 clusters and some of our biggest clusters have more than 6,000 nodes. Um, for, um, on, the, on the microservices, we have like each cluster running like uh, more than 100K containers with 10K updates happening per day. And on the batch side, we have like a million containers being supported within a day. So we operate at a really large scale. And uh, we've built up uh, all our infrastructure around Mesos, but over time, we've seen that the, uh, the community, the industry is kind of converging around Kubernetes, and that's what brings us to Kubernetes. Uh, in addition to a thriving community where uh, applications are now built on Kubernetes first, uh, we also have features in Kubernetes that we are missing right now in Mesos. For example, support for sidecar, or support for auto scaling. So these are the things that, which make us uh, believe that maybe Kubernetes is in our future and we need to move away from Mesos. Okay. Thank you, thank you guys. Uh, we are at different stages and we learn our lessons in different stages as well. Uh, so for today's panel, we've uh, prepared a couple of questions that uh, people would be commonly interested in. And we're gonna start these questions first and have our panelists share their ideas, their stories. Uh, and at the end, we're going to be handling over the microphones to our audiences and take the questions as well. Um, so let's start with something at the very high level. So for other companies, are we starting adopting Kubernetes in different stages? Um, how is Kubernetes used in each of the companies? And what is the hosting model for both customers inside the companies and probably as a cloud provider or customers outside the company? Asham, probably Alibaba is the one that went the furthest, so you want to start with that? Okay, so for the uh, hosting model, we provide two models. So first, we have a shared pool, is a public pool. So that Kubernetes cluster is managed by our team, and that the node of the cluster is also managed by our, our team. It's like a serverless model. So the user of the uh, cluster only use Kubernetes APIs. They can submit uh, drops to Kubernetes, submit deployments to Kubernetes. That's one model. And we have another model. Some of the uh, business units, they want to have their dedicated Kubernetes clusters, and we do provide pro provision dedicated Kubernetes to those uh, customers, and they use uh, like they have their own node management systems, and uh, they connect to the API server that we manage. So we basically have two two kinds of customers, and some of our customers also want to run on Ali Cloud, and on Ali Cloud is they use the uh, typical like uh, EKS type of thing. So basically, in Alibaba, the Kubernetes API itself is directly exposed to the user. Well, no. So okay. for some of the users, for most of the users, for our, in our public pool, we have a pass platform. The user actually consumes the pass platform directly. And for the dedicated clusters, or for the users use the ACK, they con sometimes consume the Kubernetes API directly. I see. Uh, what about Pinterest? Uh, sure. So just as I mentioned, we run the real multi-tenancy hectogenous cluster for the whole company. Mm -hmm. So we, all of our teams and uh, projects, they share the same cluster and uh, they even share the nodes. And uh, we have a gateway service in front of Kubernetes. So the users can only program or talk to that gateway service, which will do all kinds of validation, triple A, all kinds of stuff. Well, after they pass that, we, um, we they, all, they can submit jobs while that uh, gateway services. And uh, we, we, on our side, we do have uh, some small, uh, we, we do have some separate clusters due to compliance uh, reason, a reason we take security as very, uh, we take security as very high priorities. And uh, when we run Kubernetes, we found it's very important that we need to bet on the, we need to integrate with the existing infrastructures we have. Before the Kubernetes world, we already in, invest a lot in our security, traffic, service mesh, all kinds of uh, infrastructures. They are battle tested. There's no way for us to abandon them. And they are battle tested for our scale. And uh, we found uh, we, uh, we leverage CRDs a lot to integrate Kubernetes with them. That able, that enable us to integrate with them and our users even doesn't need to know about all these components while they're existing and uh, migrating from the VM world to the Kubernetes world is much easier due to this structure. 
I see. Thank you. Uh, so I think Netflix and Uber on this uh, on this uh, on this topic will share the roughly the same stories because both of you guys have been invested in Messel's world. So uh, are you guys able to share the stories as well? Probably we start with Uber. Sure. Um, so Uber is actually it really early stages of its journey to Kubernetes. Um, we. For us, we need to make sure that the Kubernetes supports the architecture and the scale that we need. For example, we've been toying with two different proposals that we have. Um, one is, on, um, so as of today, we have our own uh, job scheduling system, a uh, system called Peloton that we use for running on uh, uh, our containers on Mesos. And we are toying with the idea of either you know, switching the bottom half of that uh, and replacing it with, with just Cube, uh, API server and Kubelet, or go the hard way and you know refactor and uh, re-architect Peloton so that it fits neatly into the Kubernetes ecosystem as a controller manager or uh, as a deployment controller, as an admission controller, as a scheduler uh, through CRDs and so on and so forth. So we are evaluating both options and we need to still understand what works for us and what is, gives us the best value. And Netflix? Yeah, so I mean, Netflix is in a similar position as well to where Titus is very similar to like an internal cloud provider to where users don't necessarily know what a cluster or anything necessarily is underneath the hood. Um, it's a federated model that we have multiple cells and it just so happens some of these cells are Mesos based and some of these cells are Kubernetes based at this moment. But as a user, you're gonna be using a higher level PaaS or a higher level system such as Spinnaker or a workflow system to launch a containerized workload. And then these are gonna go through our API, which will land you on some cluster. See. Let's move forward to uh, the second topic. So I know a lot of people are interested in the scale, like how fast or how big or how, how, uh, how, how efficient that Kubernetes can be. Uh, so the second question is about like, uh, what is the scalability and how efficient uh, Kubernetes is? And what does it mean, scalability and efficiency? What does it mean to you? And uh, uh, what does it look like? How do you deal, how do you deal with this problem? Uh, probably Uber, do you want to, uh, Amit, do you want to start with it? Right, okay. So, uh, like I mentioned before, we, we operate at really large scales, and uh, so, so something that we expect from our Kubernetes clusters is like each cluster supporting about a 1K nodes and um, with a throughput of like 1K containers per second. Uh, so, and this is, this is like some, some, something that we need at least because we, uh, we want to support our big data workloads which are currently running on something like Yarn and Yarn supports much higher throughput rates. Uh, towards this end, to, to really understand whether we could satisfy the scale with Kubernetes, we did some experiments on our side. Uh, for example, we looked at ETCD which we thought might be a bottleneck uh, and simple benchmarking simply against ETCD, we found that the read and the write throughput was sufficient for our scale. Then we moved on to testing against API server, right? So you have a simple uh, Kubernetes system where you directly launch pods against the API server without involving the deployment controller or the air scheduler, so that you, you essentially bind po uh, pods up front. And what we found was that uh, with uh, something like a 8K node cluster, and uh, it took us about five minutes to launch uh, 40K pods. And this, this was something that was not acceptable to us. So then we went ahead and investigated what was wrong, what was, where, are, where were we spending time, and through some research and reading up of the code, we found out that during this process of launching 40K pods, there were 10X the number of pod events which were generated, and which introduced a lot of load on API server and the storage system, or both on the network and the storage. So we decided let's just drop the pod events and see what, how it goes. And, by doing so, we were actually able to reduce the time it took to launch, launch these 40 k pods to about 30 seconds. So these are the kind of optimizations that we are looking at to find out you know, how best we can take the system that is there in, in Kubernetes and make it fit to our needs. And for Alibaba, you guys have uh, written a lot of blogs as well. Anything you want to share to our audiences today about scalability? 
So our scale is pretty large. It's uh, similar to uh, Google Bog. So um, initially, we feel that uh, scalability may be the hardest part for uh, Kubernetes, for example, for the API server or for ICD. But after some uh, investment, we feel that actually API server and uh, ICD is fine for this kind of skill. And as the Uber people mentioned that, actually the storage and the networking is the hardest part because you need to provision the uh, uh, CNI for each port. You need to provision, say, a persistent volume for each container. That actually takes a large time large amount of time, so we are right now optimizing that, that part a lot. And uh, for, uh, for efficiency, I think we not only care about the efficiency of Kubernetes itself, well, we also care about the efficiency for the, the node, for example, how much CPU utilization you can hit. And for that, we do a collocation, so we collocate the big data workload with our online serving workload. And Kubelet is not designed for that, so we made some modifications to that. So we add CPU set to the uh, current CPU share model of, Ku of Kubelet. And we also have uh, two-level scheduling. Sometimes we run the big data framework on top of uh, Kubernetes and do bound collocation, which means that we allocate a very large part for uh, a big data framework and then let the big data framework to launch a uh, smaller container in that or smaller process in that uh, container. And uh, that uh, um, another thing that we are doing right now is we use the Kata container to uh, actually run some of the big data workload because we found that some of the uh, big data workload actually affecting the kernel performance and that affect the uh, low latency requirements uh, of the online service workload. So I think efficiency of the computing utilization is also important for the Alibaba uh, use case. And we also care about the developer efficiency, which means that how fast the developer can actually um, deploy their application to the uh, Kubernetes uh, platform. And for that, we are improving our uh, PaaS platform to make it more Kubernetes native so that people can use it. So previously, the PaaS platform is not super like Kubernetes native. We migrated from the old system to the new system. Right now, we want to make the PaaS platform more Kubernetes native. So if people learn Kubernetes concepts, they can use uh, our PaaS platform more easily. Thank you. Uh, and I think like for the rest of the two companies, uh, Netflix and Pinterest, we are currently undergoing massive migrations from one system to another. Um, so let's spend some time in talking about the migrations. Uh, what is the biggest or Kubernetes adoptions? So the next, next question is, uh, is going to be, uh, what is the biggest pain point uh, you guys face when adopting Kubernetes? And what is the status uh, of each of the companies dealing with that? Uh, Pinterest, uh, June, do you want to start with? So uh, actually, we are still in the active uh, in the active transition state from the VM world to the Kubernetes world. So we learned a lot of hard lessons, actually hard lessons during the migration world. So one one thing is that you you can never just it's not achievable that you build a perfect cluster, perfect compute class uh, platform for all your for all your customers. You have to do a lot of patches, different feature, design different features, different all the uh, implement all different tools while you are onboarding each customers. So as example, like uh, we. We built our visibility dashboard for the whole cluster while onboarding our largest uh, service fleet. And we take their, the, the team, the web apps team, uh, their feedback very seriously and try to upgrade our uh, visibility dashboard. As soon as possible, we get their feedback. And uh, we also discover a lot of issues uh, with like um, uh, how we manage the TensorFlow, TensorFlow operators while we onboarding our largest uh, machine learning workloads. And uh, there are also issues with like we don't provide enough visibilities to logins or other stuff while we are onboarding them. So it's always an ongoing process with uh, such a small team trying to catch up all, all this huge load. And as I said, our, our cluster, our compute platform based on Kubernetes is very successful within the company and we have a lot of organic growth. Users come to us and ask if you can help me to solve these problems. But for us, we need to evaluate all the features carefully. Otherwise, if you make the promise and cannot deliver that, that's really bad. 
And uh, on the other side, we found that we have a lot of overhead on supporting the customers. Think about its active uh, transition states. And our engineers, uh, they are very comfortable and very used to the old VM world. They know all the concept of VM, VMs, VPC, all, all this old stuff. They can access it into the host with uh, security support, do all kinds of debugging there. But it's not that easy to support all this kind of work. work just the way of they are working on Kubernetes. So once they jump to the Kubernetes ship, they found, oh, why can't I SSH to my pod? It's, the connection is not so stable. Why can't I not do this? And many times I need to talk to my customers. Say, we build the logging pipeline into our uh, clusters. You need to write more logs. So this is man size change. We have to support them and do a lot of education. So we found that education sessions or code labs, all this kind of supporting is very important. And we have very small teams. So we have to try our best to do on, try to unload us from customer support. This is another pain point we found. So if you, have, you are in this kind of transition, I think it's some preparation for customer education is very important. And try to invest more on the debugging visibility and uh, and uh, uh, debugging visibility tools, not only like API or CLI. Uh, uh, use for UI is very important. And hear what your customer, really listen to what the customer says. Uh, like say, the, I want to know what version is running on the cluster. I want a one click uh, one click access to my logs. That's well, We got a very good feedback from those process. Staying on the same team, developing and selling Kubernetes, I have exactly the same feeling. Thank you, June. Uh, and what about Netflix? I was in uh, your talk about virtual Kubelet yesterday, and what's interesting happening behind? Yeah, so I think, um, I haven't actually mentioned this yet, but so <laughs> Titus isn't really use. I didn't mention this explicitly, Titus is not using all of the Kubernetes pieces at this point. We're only using API server, etcd, and virtual Kubelet which if you haven't heard of vir virtual kubelet yet, you can think of it more as a high-level shim that understands the, the kubelet protocol but has um, uh, extension points to where you can plug in your own logic. So because we already had a uh, Titus executor that uh, did setting up of C groups, all of the networking, uh, log management, et cetera, we more or less connected virtual kubelet to our already existing container runtime. And I think a lot of the challenges for us is how do we use Kubernetes extension points to fit in an already rich infrastructure ecosystem since Netflix has a lot of tools and a lot of infrastructure that's already built, as well as, I guess, in the, the general like uh, CNCF problem of how do we take CNCF projects and fit that into our existing infrastructure? So I guess it's not only the containerized workloads or applications, but also how do we do things like monitor our Kubernetes clusters? So, for instance, we don't use Prometheus at Netflix. We have our own system called Atlas that's open source. So we've had to do a lot of work on learning how to convert from one concept to another, as well as just gaining experience in um, this newer technology for us. Thank you. Uh, and, and at this moment, uh, we would like to hand over the, uh, the microphones to our, uh, to our audiences. Like, we're going to take questions from you guys. Um, I see your hands here. I'm probably going to start from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the things I've seen here across KubeCon is that it's not just running a Kubernetes cluster. You've got all kinds of add-ins. You got it in. You got uh, custom resources. You got operators. How do you guys manage the upgrades for those? Do you do you plan upgrades on an existing cluster, or do you build a new cluster with the new stuff and expect to migrate workloads over? Sean? I think that's a very interesting question because at Alibaba we have more than, we have more than 13 controllers and uh, we have a lot of uh, third party operators and how to uh, make sure that um, those uh, controllers are doing the right thing and how to make sure that uh, those operators are safe is a uh, Big challenge for us right now, so we are trying to we are trying two things. So f one thing we are trying is to we try to build a sidecar um, 
controller. So basically, we want to make sure that every uh, controller will not talk to API server directly, but they talk to API server through a set card. And we start to manage those set cards to make sure that they are not doing crazy stuff. And the second thing that we are doing is to uh, limiting the uh, access of all these uh, controllers by injecting another API server between the uh, master API server and the uh, controller. Basically, the uh, controllers that we don't trust only access to one small API server. And that's, is, is, we call it virtual cluster. If anyone is interested, you can uh, check the uh, Kubernetes blog post. I think we published the architecture on the uh, blog post. So we are trying two things to manage all these controllers. So uh, I think I have some experience with this one. So we, are also ha we also have a lot of controllers who are extensive use, uh, user of CRDs. And we have, I think, three layers of protection. The first, uh, right now, we don't allow any customer controller. All the controllers are written by the system the infrastructure team. So uh, as a team, if they want to contrib uh, contribute to this, they need to go through the strict code review so they understand uh, education and code review so they understand what they are doing. The second layer is we have end-to-end -end test running on all the clusters. Uh, beside, our, beside our production cluster, we have a playground test for our, you, you, uh, for our own developers. We have staging clusters and we have a production cluster. So users need to, uh, all the deployment goes starting from the playground cluster. The, after they pass all the end-to-end -end tests, they promote to the staging cluster and then to the product cluster. So we have uh, this graduation. And uh, for some critical upgrade, like uh, the Kubernetes version upgrade, we even, uh, we even require the baking time on the staging cluster for at least one week. And uh, uh, we have, moni of course, we have monitoring on the end-to-end uh, -end test and all the other monitoring we have. And the other, uh, the last, uh, the last layer actually is we require like uh, very critical users, uh, critical applications. They must have a presence on the staging cluster and have monitoring on their workloads on the staging cluster. So whenever a new version of uh, cluster components rolls to the staging cluster, if they receive any alerts on their own applications, we need to look into that. Both teams need to look into that and see that. I would say maybe it's still suitable at our scale, but based on the scale, like for example, Alibaba scale, this may not work, but depends on the scale. Okay, we have three minutes left. We can take another questions. Uh, any hands up? Okay. So I'm um, just curious, how large are your teams? Uh, and what are your, like, uh, how do you forecast out your timetables with your, the size group of engineers that you have? You mean the human operational or, or d developing team size? Yep. Okay. Uh, Netflix, want to start? So I guess the compute platform team at Netflix is 11 people, and we design, build, operate, and support the entire company. And um, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure everyone here would love more resources, but um, I, th I think it's just a, you have to do a good job at balancing, and I think you have to just keep monitoring all of these aspects, and you have to figure out and make a case when it's no longer feasible for you to continue on with your current responsibilities. Uber has about 25 engineers in the compute team. And um, one of the things that we find is works for us with a small team is to automate as much as possible, right? If you build automation that does the mundane tasks, moves it out of the way, then you can actually concentrate on doing something more value added. So that's what we're trying to do. Pinterest and Alibaba. Okay. Yeah. So um, the whole compute platform team has less than one, less than ten people, and half of it is doing service mesh, and half, the other half is doing Kubernetes and uh, other compute platform stuff. And we need to support the whole company. So as I said, we need to budget our uh, engineering resource very, uh, very carefully. Otherwise, uh, we don't, it's the first thing is you never want to promise some feature that you are not going to deliver. And so this is very carefully. And uh, we also need, we, let's say, we, we need to, uh, we, need, we need some people like working on the Kubernetes core part. We need people, we have people working on the controller. We have a uh, one-man, one-man team working on the visibility tool. And all the other, all the people needs to jump on the customer support. And um, it's it's really sweet problem to have, I would say. 
Thank you. So we have about 10 people working on code Kubernetes, another 10 people working on the SRE side of the things, but we also have other people working on, say, capacity planning, application support, and uh, like past platform, and all other areas. So the overall team is pretty large, but uh, about 20 people working on Kubernetes alone. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I think our time is up, but uh, our panelists are going to hang around for a while, and if you have additional questions, feel free to catch up with us. Uh, thank you guys for coming, and. Hope you enjoy the rest of the KubeCon.